local history, local culture, local events, your community. This is the Joe Kelly Show. Hi there, everybody. Welcome to the show. Thanks for joining us. John Swan's our guest. John uh, is a familiar face and familiar voice to a lot of people around here. He started back at uh, WIBX a long time ago and uh, as the news director. Then he came right up here. WUTR was news director and went over to SUNY and did PR work over there and then ended up, I think, John, as executive vice president at Community Foundation. Mm -hmm. Yes? Mm -hmm. And now he's out with a book, and the book is what we're going to be talking about. But before we do that, we're going to say welcome. Glad to see you here. Welcome home, I should say. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. it's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Uh, a Charlie Chan mystery, Death I Said, uh, just out, brand new. Um, I know you've written at least one other book. N this is your first nonfiction. The, the other book was uh, from... Uh, Mars from the mills to Marcy from the mills to Marcy and that was a nonfiction book about SUNY mm -hmm. what gave cause to write a Charlie Chan mystery by the way Charlie Chan is one of my favorite detectives oh well that's good to hear as well as Frank Tomano who's ah. a favorite guest up here he loves Charlie Chan he's got all the old movies as well as Mr. Moto mm -hmm. yeah but anyway what what gave rise with you to do a, a Charlie Chan mystery well a lot of people i guess had the same experience that i did i was growing up in the midwest and there were two or three channels to choose from and a lot of television stations in in those days the 60s and early 70s would air movies from the 30s and 40s that they had acquired through mm. some sort of syndication package and the charlie chan films were on late at night and on weekends yeah. so as a kid I discovered the films and then I went to my local library and said, are there any books? And it turns out I discovered that the Chan of the films was immediately adapted to a series of best-selling mysteries starting in almost 100 years ago, 1925. Mm -hmm. And so I thought over the years, I was always kind of saddened by the fact that the author had done the series, had done six books that were, were bestsellers. Of all of those movies, he died at age 48, and he had been planning a seventh book in the series. So this is my effort to do the seventh book. And you're talking about Earl Deer Biggers. That's right, Earl Deer Biggers, who was a Midwesterner like, like me, um, who had been to Hawaii once in 1920, five years before the first book came out. But he said later that he discovered his inspiration for Chan reading newspapers at the time, and there was a column about this Chinese detective, the only Chinese detective on the Hawaiian Honolulu police force, Chang Apana. And he, he was a, a colorful character, he was very dynamic, he was much different, of course, than the Chan of fiction. But Biggers began to think, what if, what if I did a character that was a Chinese detective, unlike all of the Asian villains of mm. fiction and of films of the day, what if it were, he were the hero? Yeah. And that's how Chan came into, into being in, in print. That uh, uh, original uh, Hawaiian detective, uh, small guy. Yes, he was a short, the real Charlie Chan. He became known as Charlie Chan and during his uh, retirement years. He was a wiry, short person who packed a bullwhip and was known for breaking up gangs of toughs in, in the uh, 1890s and around the turn of the century in Honolulu. And it was just the idea that he was Chinese and that he had, was a successful detective that Biggers took away. Biggers said he didn't base the Charlie Chan character on the real Chang Apana, but he got that inspiration, and I think that's part of what appealed to the wider audience. Hawaii was a very exotic place then. Mm -hmm. Most Americans, most people on, on the mainland had never been to Hawaii, so mm -hmm. that exoticism, I think, was part of what helped sell the character. Yeah. 
And uh, was he something like five foot tall or something? I mean, he, yes, Chang yeah. Apana was like five five feet tall, very wiry, yeah. uh, capable of a lot of athletic endeavors when he was pursuing criminal. Yeah, and uh, the uh, the movies, the TV shows that we would see in black and white, which added so much to it. You know that black and white element uh, to it. Um, there were two Charlie Chans, at least two uh, famous ones that we're familiar with, yes? Two really well-known ones, although the first actors to portray Chan, whose names are really lost to history now, uh, is starting in the silent period, were Asian. But the two that most people are familiar with are Warner Oland, who was born in Sweden, and uh, Sidney Toller, who was actually born in my home state, Missouri, and they made the bulk of the best-known Chan films of the 1930s and 40s. Didn't uh, uh, Warner Olin, he died, and then... Uh, yes, and then Sidney, Sidney Toller Tol continued. And now yeah. this, we, we're looking here at... Uh, that's Warner Olin on the right in Chan makeup, and that is Chang Apana on the left. And as I said, not only the books were so well-received, but the films, it was you know, a sensation in popular culture in mm -hmm. those days. And so as part of a publicity tour, uh, Warner Olin was in Honolulu and actually met Chang Apana that mm. one time. Now, Warner Olin doesn't look Swedish. No, in fact, he often said that he had uh, Mongolian ancestry on one side of his family, although that's been, that has been debated. But he, he thought that he had Asiatic features and he often played Asian characters. Mm -hmm. In fact, he played Asian villains before he landed the Chan role. And back in those days, most of the uh, Oriental people that you saw in movies were villains, yes? Fu Manchu is the most famous stereotypical example of that. And, and the Chan character, I think, was the first real effort to, to bridge East and West in a meaningful way culturally. And Biggers, you saw this, progress through the novels, not so much in the, in the films, but not only to make Chan a hero, but to make him a complex character who acknowledges that he is neither Eastern nor Western, that his elders criticize him for being too Americanized, while his children are even more American than he is. So he's sort of caught in the middle mm. culturally. And uh, he had number one son and number two son and number three son, I think. Those were in the films part of Hollywood's effort to inject humor to give him a sidekick role, which you, know, you saw in the Basil Rathbone, Nigel Bruce mm -hmm. films with the comical Dr. Watson. In the books, not so much, but in both the books and the films, Chan is portrayed as a family man. He has somewhere between 11 and 14 children. Uh, in the books, the children are mentioned, but they don't play that comic sidekick role. And you mentioned my other favorite detective, Sherlock Holmes. John Swan's our guest. We're talking about his new book. It's about Charlie Chan, a Charlie Chan mystery. Short break, right back. And welcome back, everybody. Thanks for sticking with us. John Swan's our guest. We're talking about his brand new book, A Charlie Chan Mystery, Death I Said. And uh, it's just out. In fact, it's uh, this week, right, John? Yep. And uh, it's available where? Available everywhere. Okay. In local bookstores, of course. And, and it's nationally distributed, so. Uh, and it's done. Everything about the book is local. That's true. You're local. Uh, my daughter did the uh, central image on the cover and an old friend, Lynn Brown, who, with whom I worked at uh, SUNY, a uh, graphic artist and designer, did the book design. And it's published by Nicholas K. Burns Publishing, um, who's a local publisher. Yeah. yeah, I know Nick. He's up on Proctor Boulevard, if I recall correctly. Um, the book sells for... 
1395 13, list, but you know the retailers will discount and mm -hmm. do what they do. It, and it, you know, I was uh, wandering around online the other day, and your Marcy Suny book is still available online. Oh yes, I've seen it. it shows up. Uh, there's actually, I saw a signed copy on eBay, and I thought, well, I don't know if I could afford that <laughs> or not. <laughs> the uh, book is 152 pages long. Uh, why did you set it in San Francisco? Chan, the character in the books, uh, has a history of, at San Francisco, and in one of the uh, Earl Dirk Biggers books, which this is a continuation of that series, one of his daughters is said to be going to school on the mainland, and so Chan, some of Chan's past uh, exploits have occurred in San Francisco, and I thought it would be, it would be fun and interesting to take the daughter character, Rose, who is mentioned in Biggers as attending college on the mainland and situate her in San Francisco having graduated and applying to law school and then giving Chan a reason both to visit family and also uh, uh, there's a request for his services as well. So. Mm -hmm. And um, did you try to emulate the style of Biggers? As much as possible you know, to avoid anachronisms, right? So you don't want a period piece, which this is, the setting is 1930s San Francisco. So first things first, avoid uh, phrases, characterizations, dialogue, slang that wasn't in vogue then or that didn't exist then. Um, and some of the, uh, the phrasing and the way words are constructed, uh, even use of hyphenation, things like that. I tried to stay true to Biggers without it being clunky and an obstacle to the modern reader, too, because mm -hmm. tastes have changed. Yeah. And, you know, some things have dated and some things hold up fairly well. Uh, there, in the movies, at least, there was a lot of uh, what they called, uh, or what I'll call Chan-isms. Yes, the aphorisms, the mm -hmm. sayings, and so there is a great deal of that here, and what I've tried to do is go back to, to Bigger's original inspirations for that, which is really a continuation of what you would think of as the Eastern wisdom tradition. So if you look at what Chan said in the books, he's really drawing off of Confucianism mm -hmm. and Taoism, uh, the Analects of Confucius, even some Buddhist sayings, so there's very much a hint of that, and that gets back to the East meets West cultural interest of this whole project. So there is that, what later became almost stereotyped in the films, people called them fortune cookie type aphorisms and sayings. So try to strike a balance there between situating them in their source material, the Eastern wisdom tradition, thousands of years of philosophy, and yet recognizing that this fictional character is living in, in the early 20th century and he's, he's an American, striving to be an American professional detective. I wrote down a few of those. I, I'll keep calling them Chanisms. Um, I wrote down a few. It was online and I looked up uh, a few of them, a couple that I like. Um, for a detective, I think this is a good one. To think is one thing, to have proof is another. Right, and that's very much in the spirit of them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, have two ears, but can only hear one thing at a time. Right. And um, very difficult to estimate depth of well by the size of the bucket. And those are the things, they've been collected and published by, by authors uh, in recent years, in fact, collections of the aphorisms from the films and from the books because pe people don't realize that sometimes they're paraphrases of a Confucian or a Taoist saying mm -hmm. or something you know, from, from ancient Eastern wisdom tradition. Uh, are you a writer like a, a, a Dorothy Parker who famously said, I hate writing but love having written, or are you somebody who enjoys the process of writing? Well, it's a mix. You know, you have to try to enjoy the process of writing, but it is a kind of work, a kind of intellectual struggle, because you're imagining not only scenes and events, but also dialogue, and you have to draw on your own experience, but also the source material here, which is why I think easing into writing fiction using this kind of template and using Bigger's inspiration 
also using the, the, the notoriety of the Chan films because the Chan character is a golden age of mystery and detective fiction character. And you could mention him in the same breath as Hercule Poirot, which is very well known now because of the Kenneth Branagh films, other Agatha Christie characters, other golden age authors. It's in that tradition. So there's, there's a template, uh, you know, a foundation for how you write that sort of fiction, I think. Uh, how long did it take to write the book? Uh, some matter of months. I didn't really keep track, and I worked on it in fits and starts. So it started in uh, 2022 and finished up uh, earlier this year. Pretty fast. Well, <laughs> well, it's not. A, I'm comparing it to my speed. It's not a Russian novel, so yeah. it's you know not thousands of pages long. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, by some, by some, it, it all depends, right? Your writing speed, your writing style. So uh, sometimes I think maybe it was too fast. Sometimes you want to go back. You, you know, as yeah. a writer, you always want to go back and see if you could improve on things. Yeah. But, yeah. but there will be a second book. So if I feel like I want to improve on the first, then I have another bite at the apple. I was uh, going to ask you about that. If there is a sequel? There is, and you think of it as the eighth book in the Biggers tradition, and it will advance the character along the same timeline that Biggers was using, because Biggers had Chan age and progress and become more Americanized and become less of the stereotype that he was depicted as in the first novel. You really see that progression as the popularity of the character took off. How do you write? Do you, do you write... Uh uh, on a computer, typewriter, longhand, what do you do? Mostly on a computer, but I have been known to think of a scene or a scrap of dialogue and jot it down on a, a notes program in, in the iPhone and mm -hmm. even scribble things on pieces of paper randomly too. Yeah. Mostly on the computer. Yeah. The, uh, we were talking about uh, with the crew here earlier today and uh, I started on a manual typewriter. I look back on it now and I think, how the heck could you write on a manual typewriter, you know? I mean, it's just so tough. I guess people of our generation all did, and when yeah. I worked in newsrooms from the first, manual typewriters you know, were the, the standard, and the lucky person over there was the one who happened to have an IBM Selectric, you know? That, yeah. was, that was really a... That's where we progressed to, from yeah. manual typewriters and Underwood to uh, IBM Selectric and then into the computers. I was talking up at Utica College one time and I was talking about editing and I was talking about how cutting and pasting, you know, and it took me a while to get the fact that they thought I was talking about hitting buttons to cut and paste. They didn't realize that back then we actually had shears and glue pots on everybody's desk. John Swan's our guest. We're talking about his book, Death I Said. It's a Charlie Chan mystery. He'll be around at all the bookstores this week and it sells for $13.95. Great Christmas gift. Timing was good. Nick Burns timed this well. For the mystery lover that you yeah. know well, yeah. and uh, for people who like the Chan character as well. Good. Short break, right back. And welcome back, everybody. Thanks for sticking with us. John Swan's our guest. John has had a long time in this area, news and uh, public relations, and now he's out with a book, and uh, is Death, I Said, a Charlie Chan mystery, and I hope this does well for you. This is, you know, I mean, fiction's so much tougher, I think, tougher than uh, uh, writing nonfiction. I tried it, fiction once. <laughs> And it's still in the desk drawer, whatever I got done. But uh, I think it's tougher. What do you think? Well, you know, I don't have the experience that you've had. So um, this is my first effort at fiction. And I'm just glad to have gone through the process and, and see it 
get published and be talked about and looked at and perhaps it will find a home with some Chan fans and people who are interested in some of the themes that it raises. Uh, yeah. We'll see. And I'm glad uh, that uh, the book is going to be available uh, nationally because I think there is a national audience. The curious thing about the Chan character, which we've talked about a little bit, is, is it's never gone away. Hollywood has looked several times at rebooting the film series. And if you Google uh, Charlie Chan, you'll find websites. But if you look on Facebook, you'll find a half dozen Charlie Chan groups that are devoted to the films or the books or both. Uh, so it's, it seems to be one of those uh, characters that is just sustained throughout you know, modern popular detective fiction. I found another uh, Chanism. I got to share this because I love this one. Mind like parachute only functions when open. <laughs> That's a good, good one. one. Yeah. The, uh, uh, the way the book ends, does that lend itself to a sequel? Did you try to, did you try to end it in a way that would make it sequel-ish? I guess I did in a way, but I had thought of the possibility of a sequel when I was halfway through the process because I was, again, thinking like the original author and there was, he was writing serialized Chan uh, and the, the serialized uh, chapters were appearing in the Saturday Evening Post. So as soon as he would get done with the serial, then it would appear in book form. Mm -hmm. And the demand was such that he was always thinking ahead to the next book and what, would, what could he have Chan do. And so I guess there was some of that in my thinking as well. You know, it's interesting uh, how popular he was back uh, in the day. Uh, you had movies, you had uh, a stage show, uh, comics. I mean, it was just television a series, television series, comic strips, mm -hmm. radio adaptations, and of course, all of the films. There are something like uh, four dozen films. Interestingly, the copyright laws being what they were internationally, there are a lot of Chan films made in China, it's very popular in China, that were sort of bootleg. They were made without regard for American copyright law and in Cuba as well, mm. and also uh, for the Mexican and South American market. Mm. What do you think was the reason for all that popularity, John? I think there was an appeal to the character. You have this sage, right? This this the Asian wisdom tradition sage who is discriminated against in the books and in the films by you know, the Anglo, the white dominant society, all the police that he encounters are, are white. And he is the figure that overcomes through this combination of sort of Americanized savvy, but drawing heavily on his own wisdom. I'm sure that had a great deal of appeal in other countries as it did here. What did World War II, how did World War II impact the Charlie Chan brand? Well, of course, Biggers was long dead by then. Uh, he died in 1933. But in the films, gradually, and this was the case with other Hollywood productions of the time, they managed to weave into the films and into the characters and the plots uh, a, a sort of a patriotic, you know, Chan fights sinister forces, fights the Nazis, fights, you know, the, the terrorism and uh, espionage. That was woven into the Chan films just as it was in particularly well in the uh, Basil Rathbone, Sherlock Holmes films that we talked about earlier. Same concept. Did uh, uh, Charlie Chan's wife ever show up anywhere? Only in passing in a couple of the films do you see her depicted. And in the books, she is mentioned uh, and has a bit of one bit of dialogue, but she does not loom large. Mm. She stays behind the scenes. Uh, did Mr. Moto ever uh, intrigue you enough to get into that? I've read the Moto books and seen some of the films. And interestingly, the Moto character came about because Biggers died and the Saturday Evening Post wanted another exotic detective to take the place of Chan. And that led to the serialization of, uh, by Marquand, I think his name was the author, the serialization of Moto books, which were then, I think there were about a half dozen of those that were published, and then the successful series of films starring Peter, uh, starring Peter Lorre. 
I've uh, uh, talked to Charlie Chan fans, and there always seems to be, well, I like uh, Vic, uh, uh, Olin best. One actor or the uh, other. The other. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have a favorite? I, I like them both. I think they're both. I think uh, Chan fell on hard times after 20th Century Fox dropped the series. Toller, the actor, bought the film rights, and then one of the Poverty Row studios, so-called, with small budgets, made a, a fairly long series of Chan films starring Toller and then another actor. And they were, they did not compare. They, yeah. they appeared to be cheaply made because they were. Yeah. And um, they changed the uh, number one son, and I forget his name now, but... Uh, the actor? Yeah. K. Luke? Yeah. Um, he was in early Chan movies, mm -hmm. but then he was replaced. He and Warner Olin had a close relationship, and when Olin died, Luke said, I, I'm, I'm going to leave the series as well. So mm. There's a, uh, and I didn't realize, uh, uh, Key Luke, what a uh, creative person he was. He was also an, an artist. artist. Right. Yeah, he, uh, in fact, is depicted in one of the films as, as an artist or going to art school. And in real life, he was a Hollywood artist in, in the film production. Uh, line of work before he became an actor, and he continued that. Yeah, you see him also in television roles. Uh, both he and Victor Sen Young, who is the other son character, most popular. You see them show up in everything from Kung Fu hmm. to uh, Bonanza, where one of them played the the uh, cook. Right. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. On that show. Later and on. the book is dedicated to a special person. Yes. Dedicated to my wife Pat, mm -hmm. because with uh, out her constant encouragement over the years to why don't you write something? Why don't you write fiction? Why don't you write a mystery? Mm -hmm. uh, this probably would never have come to pass. So yeah. good thank for you her, her and good for you. Congratulations. Thank you, Joe. The book is on sale throughout the area. Thirteen ninety five. It's by uh, Nick Burns Publishing, and that's going to do it for us this week. Until next week, take care of yourself, everybody.